The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars, yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. That's the one that got me. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord, Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kedesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf and discovereth the forest. And his temple does everyone speak of his glory. Over and over in this passage we hear about the voice of the Lord. How many of you remember the commercial uh, guys going around with a you know, cell phone? Uh, can you hear me now? You remember that one? You date yourself. You hadn't heard it. Dude, say, I can tell. I knew he didn't hear that one. <laughs> But you remember, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Talking about the coverage and all this business of cell phone and how theirs were so much better. And can you hear me now? I believe this is what the Lord said. The Lord is saying, can you hear Him now? Are you really listening? The other day somebody asked me, and it was a pretty deep question. What's the difference between hearing and listening? Pretty good. I had to think a while. What's the difference between hearing and listening? Because the Bible says both things. Hearing and listening. And I said, and, and I, once in a while, I think I just find a nugget of wisdom that comes out of me. And it, just, it surprises me, my mother-in-law, and everybody who knows me. And I just found this, boy, just, wow, all of a sudden, it's just there. I'm like a savant. And just, there it is. And gone. But this is what I came up with. The difference between hearing and listening is obedience. You can hear and not obey. But if you listen, you will obey. God wants to, if there's anything I'm learning from this psalm, God wants us to be bring us to a place of not just hearing the words or even believing the words, but listening to the place of obedience. God is wanting us to come to a place that we listen and obey. And His voice is powerful. We see four things in this passage. Verse number 3 and 4 talks about the voice of God upon the waters. If you've ever been, if you've ever been on a boat in the middle of a thunderstorm, number one, you need to check your intelligence. But anyway, especially if it's an aluminum boat. But anyway, I've been caught, um, there's a lake down below uh, Lake Charles, uh, on the map is Calcasieu Lake, but it's, we call it Big Lake, and it's big, and it's not very deep, and so when the winds come up, man, the waves, and I've been out there, and when a thunderstorm will come up quick, but it's amazing that when you're on the water, the thunder is much louder than when you're on ground, because water amplifies the noise. And man, you'd think, you know, all oh, heaven is breaking loose when you hear that thunder scares you to death. I crawled down the boat thinking maybe if I get smaller, lightning can't hit me. But anyway, you, you've been there. If you've, if you've been on water in the middle of a storm, you understand that that water amplifies that, that noise. And now when I think about this, I'm thinking that the Lord wants to wake us up and get our attention. Because so many times we go on cruise control on life, get in our little comfort zone, and God has to slap His hands a few times and say, listen, hear me and listen up. I have something to say, and I have something to say to you today. And so many times we come to church week after week, not wanting, willing, or ready to hear what God has to say today in our hearts and lives. We always think God is talking to somebody else. Amen? I've had that. Man, preacher, I wish old Joe would have been here. Well, she's here. No, I'm... <laughs> of all the ones, Joe, you're here. Uh, I wish John was here. Man, he needed that. Lord knows. Do you, you think maybe God knows who's going to be here today? Amen? 
Maybe it's for you. Every time we come in the presence of God's Word, we need to be willing and ready to receive God's voice today for us where we are as we're living today. And sometimes God has to wake us up. The message is for us today. Get our attention. Because we get in our comfort zone, we get on cruise control, and we forget God is really active, and He wants to talk, and He wants us to listen. And it's powerful. The Bible says it's full of majesty. The Word of God is still powerful. Someone said, boy, I'm going to tell you, if God would speak to me, I'd listen. Then open your Bible. God is speaking. Listen. What would be more powerful? God speak through a cloud and be gone or write it down so it's eternal? I believe the written word. You know, it's just like, you know, we, my wife and I, for the last two, two almost three weeks, we've been separate. So we've been, we've been separated, not legally. She's been taking care of some grandkids in Houston, and I've been up in, around Shreveport. And, but anyway, we even had Fourth of July different. But anyway, uh, but one day I came in, she left the day before, and I don't know, I think it was Father's Day. And so I go to shave, and there is a card that my thoughtful, loving wife left before she, and there it was right there. How wonderful of a husband I am, how good a father I was. I read that, I cried like a baby. Now, I want you to know if she'd have called me and told me that, that would have been impactful. But that written card was a lot more impactful to me. And it's still there. And when my grandkids write, give me a little card and they write in it, I want you to know the written word is far more powerful than a spoken word could ever be because it's there permanent. You can read it over and over and over again. His word is powerful. He needs to wake us up. God needs to get our attention so we'll listen. Then verse number five talks about what it, how powerful. It says it breaks the cedars of Lebanon. That verse got me that day as I was sitting as a 17-year-old boy in, at youth camp. God breaks the cedars of Lebanon. If you read that, you forget maybe not knowing what the cedars of Lebanon represented. They were huge. They were the pride of Lebanon. As the redwood forest is the pride of California, representing standing through eons of time, storm after storm, the cedars of Lebanon were those types. They have stood generations after generation through eons of time, through storms and through different even, even different uh, government, they've been there. No matter what's happened around, those cedars were there. They were a representative of all that was powerful, all that was long-standing. And those cedars were so great that when Solomon came time to build the temple, he wanted those cedars as part of the temple building. Because what they represented, how powerful and great they were, and, and here we find in Scripture that the Bible says the Word of God's able to break those hard, strong cedars of Lebanon. What spoke to me that day was God was able to get, go against my will. And He was able to break it. And I come to the conclusion, God wanted to break my will. Didn't want to break my spirit, but He sure wanted to break my will. And I came to a wonderful conclusion that day that's followed me the rest of my ministry. The only way to serve God is to have your will broken. And only then could He use me. A place of absolute surrender in which I bring nothing to the table. I hold on to nothing. I am nothing. I have nothing. Full and absolute surrender simply means I give up and there is, there's no but about it. You know, I give up, but now, Lord, you can't have this. I, I give up, but now this is off limits. Full and absolute, there is no, no fine lines to, no fine print. It's absolute. 
No reservation. No requirements. I just surrender. We understand during World War II, Japan wanted to surrender, but they wanted to keep their emperor as God, and that didn't work. The only way surrender would be taken is if Japan surrendered absolutely. First, they wanted to keep their emperor as God and their army intact. America said, no way. Finally, they came to a place of absolute surrender. Absolutely. No army. No God emperor. Absolute surrender. God wants us to get to a place to break our will. We talk about how... we. In fact, sometimes we look at, well, he's got a stubborn will. We think that's pretty prideful. That's horrible. Pride is a terrible thing. It's one of the things God hates. And to have a stubbornness and a will, you know, we, we, we value that sometimes in our human culture, but God never does. And He wants to break us to the place in which we give up. We die to self. We put that right flag up, says, I'm it, I'm gone, I'm tapping out. That happened to me when I was 17 years old at the altar. I tapped out. I no longer had an agenda, had a will, had a, a desire. I did not own me anymore. I did not own my past. Present and future was all his. Whatever God wanted me to do. If he wanted to call me to preach and have me die somewhere, that's all right. I was his. But only then do you get freedom. And only then can God use us. The reason why we have so many people that are attempting to serve God and not doing it very effectively is because they're still very willful. They're stubborn. They want to surrender on their terms. God doesn't operate that way. It's full and absolute. And what I learned from this is that even the stubborn, cold-hearted, he can break that wheel and get you to a place. I'm done. I think a church has to get to that place. I think every preacher has to get to that place. I think every Christian has to get to that place. I'm done. Absolute surrender. I bring nothing. I have no agenda. I have no will. I have no desire. But you. I'm an empty, I'm just, I'm empty. Any desire that I have from now on has to come from you. Any will that I has to have has to come from you. Any thoughts I have has to come from you. Any, anything that needs to be done, you're going to have to give it to me. I am absolutely surrendered. And God's able to break that old stubborn will that I had as a young man. I've seen others have. I've, I've been dealing with churches for like seven years through the convention. I've pastored. I've been a missionary. I've been a church planner. And the greatest problem I've seen in churches has been the stubborn will of church members. And it's called so much heartache, so much destruction, and so much difficulty. In churches and for the cause of Christ. I don't care. This is what I want. I don't care. It's going to be my way or the highway. I've, all, I've almost heard that. I've heard so much because people stubbornly did not want to accept God's will. They were so full of their own will, they had no space for the will of God. We've got to get rid of our will. God has to break us like He does the cedars of Lebanon with His voice, so we'll finally listen and obey. Third thing is found in verse number 8, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. Will you agree with me sometimes we need to be stirred up? Amen. God needs to stir us up sometimes. The Word of God, the voice of God, the message of God needs to stir us up, set a fire upon us. And not only stir us up, it needs to straighten us up. 
needs to make a difference and straighten us up in our life and stir us up and create in us a desire, a burning desire to serve Him, a burning desire to have a vision, a burning desire to be great commissional in our life, the burning desire to live on mission, what God wants every believer to do, a burning desire to fulfill the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God needs to stir us up. I see a lot of churches that they need to be shook up. They're very comfortable. Got a good preacher, good facilities, money in the bank, got some people, and they're pretty happy. But they're not living on mission. Very comfortable. They're driven by their programs and by their management and not by vision and commission. When that happens in a church, a church loses its fervency and loses its fire. And no longer is the church on fire for God. It's cruising, being successful, but not on fire. Sometimes God's got to shake us up to get back on fire again. What it means to live on mission. What it means to be driven by vision again. Not just programs. Personnel. And management. God sometimes got to get us uncomfortable. Shake us up. Does that in stages of life, doesn't it? Amen. You know what? I told somebody when I first started the ministry, I just wanted to survive one Sunday. If I could just make it through this one Sunday, maybe they won't fire me. As I look back, I ought to go back to the first church I pastored. I ought to pay them all the money they gave me because I sure wasn't worth it. I'm just going to be honest with you. It was a mess. But anyway, uh, God, we grew. We went from seven, went from 15 to over 118 months. But I'm going to tell you, I had no clue about what to do except win people to Jesus and preach. By the way, that's not a bad thing, is it? But anyway, as I look back, I was just trying to survive. Then I, I bought into this thing, I want to be successful, whatever that looks like. And by the way, we don't even know what that looks like. And now as I come to... Towards the end of life, I'm on my last lap. I'm teeing off on the 16th hole. And I'm thinking, I want to be significant. I want something to matter. And sometimes God's got to shake us up to bring back to reality of what we need to be doing and how it all looks and whatever stage. Sometimes there's health issues that causes that. Sometimes there's financial issues. Sometimes there's other issues in the life of a church or your family that causes you to just step back, reevaluate, and shake us up a little bit. We don't like it. None of us like to be shaken. But sometimes it's what it takes for God to get us our attention and say, okay, this is what you need to be doing. This is what really matters. Because churches and individuals spend so much of their life on things that just don't matter. They discuss it, fight about it, worry about it, and it just don't matter. It, doesn't ma- it won't matter ten years from now, and it sure won't matter in heaven. May God shake us up enough with His voice that we'll listen and understand what really matters and do what really matters and let everything else take care of itself. Final thing. Verse number 9. The voice of the Lord maketh the high and the calf. A couple years ago, I thought, you know, this is kind of what I'd like to do in my ladder. I, I want to be a rancher. That, I'm going to tell you, as I look back on it, everybody heard that laugh. In fact, it was somebody here I was talking. I don't remember which one it was. So look, I think I want to get a bunch of cows. How easy is it to be a rancher? You have cows. They have babies. You sell the babies. What a lifestyle. And he says, you have no idea what it's like. And so he, meant, he started telling me what it's like for, to have calves. It's not easy. 
And he talked about it in graphic details. I like to throw it up. I said, well, that's what you get a veterinarian for. He said, you can't afford a veterinarian. So you do it yourself. The blood drained from my face. And he says, calves always have cows when it's raining, snowing, or freezing. I decided <coughs> ranching was not for me. Because that's difficult, isn't it? <coughs> when I thought about these calves having, uh, having babies and the difficulty of that is. But what happens is that it makes life. I mean, that cow has a calf that's new life. And the Word of God brings life. It's a, it's a living Word. It's not a dead book. It's a living Word. I was in Arkansas and I was, I was just a kid. I'm talking about 19 years old, preaching a revival in the hills of Arkansas. Pulled up to the church, no joke. Pulled up to the church and uh, got out and said, I want to go to the restroom. And they pointed to a building. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Evidently, he says, no, I'm not. That's it. Little half moon. That was a bathroom. And I preached a revival there and I went out. Uh, the pastor didn't even go with me. Me and Tommy Oglesby went out together and he was youth director close by and we went and visited an old guy that was the, the, he was the atheist of the community. And so we went to see him. And he was an atheist and he was well read. and uh, He read the books of John Steinbeck and all those authors. And he said, I've read all this book. I've read the Bible. And I says, I, I've come to the conclusion it's just like any other book. I said, let me tell you the problem you have. You can read Steinbeck's books and not know Steinbeck and get something out of it. But you can't read this book unless you know the author. And that's the problem. Because this book is different. It's a living book. Interpreted by a living God who lives in you. And if you don't know the author of the Bible, the Bible's not making a whole lot of sense to you. So don't be surprised when the, wor the world says, I don't get it. They don't get it because they don't get him. But when you know the author, this book makes a lot of sense. It's a living word. It makes life. It satisfies. It produces life. It makes things happen in our life. God wants to make some changes. He wants to produce life in our, in, in our family. He wants to produce life in your life. He wants to put, produce life in the church. That's what the Word of God does. It brings life. It doesn't kill. It makes alive. Satan kills. The Word makes alive. You want a live church? Make much of Scripture. Because the Scripture makes us alive. It brings life into us. It brings life into us when we don't feel like we can go another mile. It brings life into us when we don't feel like we could even live. And then the Word of God comes and revitalizes and re-energizes in us life. Because it makes that calf to hind. It makes, it, makes, it makes life. And the Word of God does that. Talk much about surrender because the bottom line is to hear the voice of God, your will has to die. I reminded of a story, I'm going to close with this. It's a, an old proverb told in the Middle East. Stories told like this in the Middle East. Every so often, the ruler of that area, they called the Raja, would come and he would come through a community and he would give wealth. This old man was standing on the side of the road and he was eating his last bowl of rice. But he heard there was a possibility the Raja would be coming right down the road where he was. And this was phenomenal because it didn't happen all the time and it was just 
one of those events once in a lifetime. And there he was at the road, which he was coming by. He was so excited. And he sat waiting. Sure enough, in the distance, he could see the dust rising. and Somebody's coming. Not just one horse, but several. It must be the righteous coming. I'm so excited. And he just sat there and he ate another piece of rice. And Oh, this is going to be his day. Sure enough, in all the majesty of the, of the prince of Arabia, he came. The Raja stood right in front of him. Beautiful horse, decked out in all majesty. And he looked at the man and he said, Rice for the Raja. And the man said, What? This is not the way it's supposed to go. He's supposed to give to me, and he wants what I have. And he said, no, I'm not going to give my rice to you. You have it all. What do you want my penance of rice? Raja again looked very sorrowfully, and he said, rice for the Raja. He said, no, I'm not going to give him but my rice. That's my rice. That's all I got in the world. It may not be much, but it's mine. I'm not going to give it away. Finally, the Roger said, rice for the Roger. And the guy reached and got just a penance, just a few kernels, and threw it at him. Here. And the Roger looked back. And with the same amount that was thrown at him, he threw the gold into his pan. The Raja left. And the man very sorrowfully said, I wished I'd have gave it all to the Raja. See, we have the opportunity this morning to hear the voice of God and sort of listen that we give it all. You'll never be sorry giving it all to the King of Kings.